In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> First, beloved of the Lord, let me greet all of you for being here tonight on behalf of the parish and also to congratulate you on assuming this ministry and mission which often feels and appears to be without hope. See, what you're doing by your involvement in this work is prophetic. And you remember how the prophets normally ended up. <laughs> I'm hoping for each of you there will be a fiery chariot. <laughs> I read the program and it says that I am the guest speaker here tonight. <laughs> The last time I was invited to speak at a pro-life thing in January was nearly 40 years ago. It was in Truro, Virginia, right before the march the next day in the Capitol. And I was part of a team, it seems to me there were six or seven of us that spoke at that big rally. I spoke last, and I think they intended for me to get everybody all fired up. And I hope I did that. But I remember some of the other speakers who spoke right before me were on the team. Everett Koop, for example, was the was the Surgeon General of the United States. Jerry Falwell, a well-known evangelist back in those days. Bernard Nathanson, a former abortion doctor who became extremely pro-life after he discovered God. It was at that, it was that rally, by the way, that he first, he first declared that he believed in God. His first time, uh, he declared he believed in God. There's so many things I want to say. I'm going to have to tie myself to the scriptures as best I can because otherwise, and I was sure, I, I thought, I won't need any notes. I need notes for control. Because <laughs> if you just turn me loose on this without anything, well, you'd miss breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the mind's contract it's compact, it's contract, it's berith, it's covenant, with reality. The mind was made for reality. Created reality. Reality is in danger right now. And creation has already been rejected even as a concept. We're dealing with the current and common notion that knowledge is the product of thought instead of the recognition of light. We might call knowledge, this knowledge man-made, except it's risky to use the word man these days. <laughs> Created reality, beloved in the Lord, is a product of light. Barashith bara Elohim et hashemayim v'hetaaretz. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Va'aretz hayeta tohu v'bohu. Va'hoshek al pani tachom. And the world was tohu. The earth was tohu v'bohu. Very mixed up. Confusion. Chaos. 
and there was darkness everywhere. Choshek al pene tachom. Darkness was on the face of the depths. Then God speaks. God's first word. Vayomer Elohim yehi or. Vayehi or. God said, let there be light. And there was light. What is this light? What's this light? He's not going to create the sun and the moon for three more days. What is this light? Genetito fos, says the Septuagint. Genetito fos, kai geneto fos. What is this light? Of course, it's the same light that appears in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. The light we read about is our Gospel reading for the night of Pascha, at night of nights then, where the light shines in the darkness. This is the light of reality because all things are created in the Logos. That's what distinguishes us from Muslims. This, this great mythology, which I'm afraid too many Orthodox have bought, that we worship the same God as the Muslims, the same God of us, they don't think so. <laughs> they know better. <laughs> the God we worship is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If he's not the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, then it is a false God. The, this is the beginning, however, of created reality, where God creates the internal truth of reality. This is God's first activity, his first energia. That's the first expression of energia, God's activity in the world. His first activity outside himself. Everything else emanates from this light. He speaks this light into creation and makes it real. And God determines that this light will have nothing to do with darkness. This darkness, this hoshek, this skotos in the Greek, has nothing to do with light. Paul made that very point when he asked the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, Eat his kinonia for ti prosopt. Proskotos. Can there be what is what kinonia? What fellowship, what communion is there between light and darkness? It was very interesting that he says that with respect to marriage. That's the context in which he speaks of that. No fellowship between light and darkness. I'm not sure I like the word fellowship very much. For me, it suggests, I don't know, something rather frivolous. I prefer the, the Latin word communion. There must be no confusion of darkness with light. There is no middle ground. They have nothing to do with one another. Between them, there is no kinonia. There is no compromise. There's not an inch of room for discussion. We cannot come to some meeting of the mind, some neutral position. It is all in. God divides and separates light from darkness. And God separates the light from the darkness. They have nothing to do with one another. The light is reality as God creates it. We can know it because of his gift of inner light that we have as human beings. It has nothing to do with chaos and the confusion of darkness. Now on the final day of creation, God makes one creature on whom he endows the capacity to perceive the light that emanates from reality. To recognize the difference between light and darkness. He makes this creature in his own image and likeness. And 
now, for the first time, the Bible speaks of sex. Although sex is found in both animals and plants, the creation account does not speak of sex except in relationship to human beings. Zakhar v'nekeba bara otam. Male and female, he created them. The first time he speaks of sex. By the way, this is parenthesis, the Greek expression there in the Septuagint, arsen kethili, male and female, is not a, it's not a, um, a combination that's found very often in the Bible. It's interesting that the two places where it really stands out is in the book of Leviticus, when it talks about sexual perversion. And these two ter terms are used. And also in Romans 1, first chapter of Romans. The very first commandment the human race receives from God is about sex. Increase and multiply. Increase and multiply. This has always, by the church, been considered to be both a blessing and a command. There's not a trace in the entire Christian tradition, there's not a trace of dissent on this point. That sex must never, from the human side, sex must never be divorced from procreation. They have to go together. God can, God can give the child. We don't, we don't try to have babies. God gives the baby. God wants us to do our part, but we must never, ever put an impediment to the activity of God. That is locking God out of the bedroom. And there'll be no blessings on any household where God is locked out of the bedroom. This has always been considered a command. There was never any dissent among the fathers of the church, East or West, Catholic or Orthodox. No dissent anywhere until the 20th century. Specifically, 1930, the Lambeth Synod of 1930. There's an Anglican Synod. 1930, the Lambeth Synod said, well, there might be some... Con there might be some occasion for, for uh, contraception. Might, by rare exception, 1930. It's interesting that the Anglican bishop said that in 1930. Last week, just this past week, those bishops decided that men can be married to men and women to women. It's a logical progression. It's a logical progression. There's a 1930, less than 100 years ago, there was full consent among all Christians of every stripe, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, whatever, all of, they didn't always agree about the Trinity or agree about, about Christ. On that point, they all agreed. That was a command without exception. In 1965, in reaction, it was, Doug, was it 1965? I'm confusing my dates. The date for what? The, 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 the encyclical. Uh, 1965. Yeah, 65, yeah. There were several major statements by church leaders in reaction to this in 1965. I want to make sure I had my dates right because we're dealing here with my memories. The most notable of these was the encyclical of Pope Paul VI, Humani Vitae, that was quickly followed by similar statements from each of the Orthodox Patriarchates. First of all, by the Ecumenical Patriarch himself and the Holy Synod of Constantinople, put out a, a joint statement. 
The reason I wanted the dates right, because I remember when I was in Rome, and it was 1965, and that's when I met Patriarch Athanagoras in 1965. Um, he had just issued his own statement in support of what the Pope said. That, is the, that has always been the official teaching of the Orthodox Church, always. No exceptions, no exceptions. Until people start to stray from the faith sometime in the late 20th century. But it is a, it is a straight straying from the faith. For the first time in Christian history, a group of bishops separated sex from creation. It was a sin against the light. As I say last week, the sons of Lambeth, that child, way to go. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate hearing that enthusiasm for this sermon. These are really very sweet people. I think when the fathers of Lambeth met in 1930, they couldn't possibly have foreseen the evils they had unleashed. Everything else has flowed from that. As soon as sex is separated from, from procreation, there's no, there's no reason anymore whatsoever if sex has to be between a man and a woman, there's no reason whatsoever. You can think of all, it now becomes quite arbitrary, quite flexible, malleable. You see, on the question of sex, the world has returned to tohu vavohu, to confusion and chaos. Children are now the disposable byproducts. The marriage is not for the procreation of children. The children are now disposable byproducts. Once God was locked out of the bedroom, everything quickly turned to confusion. And this has all happened in my adult life. Once we replace sex with gender, all bets were off. I said some similar things. Corpus Christi in June of last year to a group of Lutherans. I will not be invited back. <laughs> but I was reacting to, uh, there, were, there was a team of six of us. I was reacting to a, a statement by one of the Roman Catholic contributors there. The, uh, this lady was the head of her, head of her theology department. Um, she re made references to the, to the male gender. I said, pardon me, <laughs> there is no such thing as a male gender. There's a masculine gender, and it has to do with grammar. <laughs> okay. Human beings are not created according to the laws of grammar, but physical laws, biological laws. Uh, once we replace sex with gender, because gender is malleable. You know, the word for, the word for, for uh, a little girl in German, Mädchen, is, is das Mädchen, it's neuter. But all the little girls I ever met were all quite feminine. Now, beloved in the Lord, we have a sick society in which elementary biology is ignored. Now, who's paying the price for this insanity? Little children are paying the price for this insanity. Babies. Little babies made in God's image and likeness. Once again, we see the sacrifice of children on the altar of Baal. The founding fathers of this country were quite explicit they were trying to refound the Roman Republic. That's, that's every year, you see that everywhere. Am I right on that? I, I, you know that literature. Uh, they're trying to refound the Roman Republic. You see that's Jefferson, Adams, all of them refound the Roman Republic. What do we have now? Carthage. 
the wrong side has won the, the recent Punic War, Carthage. At the base of this predicament, this horrible thing of the sacrifice of little kids made in God's image and likeness, at the base of this, the core problem is idolatry. We're worshiping the Punic gods. We're worshiping the god of Tyre and Sidon. Quite recently, I was watching the news, which is a depressing thing to do these days. And the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States She said that abortion is good for the economy. I'm glad she had the honesty to admit what it's all about. The little children, their little bodies have to be used to, to grease the tracks of industry. It's a false god. I'm glad that the people in charge of this ministry decided that we, we weren't going to stop it just because the Supreme Court finally got something right. Because the problem still persists. It's a deeper problem, however. God will not pour his blessings on any people that slaughters children. They can expect nothing, nothing good from God. There will be no blessings. Which will bring me back to Elijah. Brings me back to Mount Carmel. Which God are we going to serve? Because there is no kinenia between light and darkness. Which God are we going to serve? That's what Elijah says, decide, decide. And then, remember, they had a little bit of uh, friendly competition? Mm -hmm. Competition. And after Elijah brings that three and a half years of drought with a simple prayer, he looks out over the sea from Mount Carmel, looks out over the sea, sees a cloud the size of a man's hand, He turns to Ahab and says, we better move. There's going to be a flood. And that began the first march for life. Where Elijah marches from Mount Carmel to Mount Horeb. Follows back in the footsteps of Moses to go to meet the living God at Horeb. The way the text reads in Kings, um, it's, it's always blown me over. Ahab, Ahab's not going to lay a hand on Elijah now. Not, not after what just happened to the priest of Baal. Not going to lay a hand on him. Ahab gets in, his, gets in his chariot, and all of his men get in their chariots, and they ride at breakneck speed. That's 16 miles that separate Mount Carmel from Jezreel. They're riding at breakneck speed. And what does the sacred text says? And Elijah ran out ahead of them. <laughs> outrunning, these, outrunning these horses for 16 miles. Well, anyway. And then he continues. He has a long pilgrimage. I've always called that the first march for life. I see I've always called it that. It was 40 years ago the last time I did it. <laughs> But I've always seen it that way, though. His first march for life. He marched by himself, with one man's conscience standing up to the entire political and social system. You, beloved in the Lord, are the B'nai Nebiim. You are the children of the prophets. You are assured of 
a great deal of darkness, despondency, discouragement, but you you fought the good fight. You're continuing to fight the good fight. The blessing of God will be upon you, on your minds, in your hearts. One cannot serve the living God fruitlessly. The living God will pour his benediction upon you and upon all your labors. And my task here tonight is simply to remind you of this. Amen. Thank you.